Welcome to Burning Eyes Tech. Today's topics is multi-factor authentication and conditional access. Today we're going to be explaining exactly what these topics actually are, why you'd want to go and use them, and where or how you can actually go and configure them. So let's jump in, guys. All right, so what is Azure's multi-factor authentication? In case you haven't guessed it yet, the MFA stands for multi-factor authentication. Now, in a nutshell, this is when you provide more than one form of proof that you are, in fact, the owner of a certain account or a certain device. Now, for people to actually understand the full grasp of what multi-factor is, you're going to have to understand what authentication is in general. So authentication is the concept of proving, obviously, that you are the owner of an account or a device. This could be something like a Facebook account, a Gmail account. It could be an account at work. So how do you normally prove that you are the owner of such an account? Normally we provide a username or an email address combined with a password. If this is a device, a laptop, a desktop, a phone, or anything for that matter, it could be that it's not just a username and a password. It could be a fingerprint. It could perhaps be a pattern that you need to go and draw on the device. The fact that your fingerprint unlocks that device or the fact that your username and password unlocks that account or that device, that's generally enough proof that you are in fact the owner of said account or device. Now, multi-factor simply just means you need to provide more than one form of proof that you actually are the owner of said device. Now, when I say more than one form of proof, this means it has to fall into more than one different category. Now, Microsoft has three different categories that it needs to fall into. Uh, I suppose it just technically needs to fall into two or more. Um, so if I, for example, give you a pin and a password, both of those would be something that you know, which would fall into the same category. So you can see there's three categories here, something you know, something you have, and something you are. So if I provide you with a pin and a password, they're both authentication, yes, don't get me wrong, but they both fall into the same category. So this would not be considered multi-factor. So an example of this would probably be if you guys go to something that we can all relate to, maybe an ATM to, have got, to withdraw money. So if you go to an ATM to go and withdraw money, what do you normally need to be able to go and do that? Generally, the average person needs a bank card of sorts and a PIN number. So the PIN is obviously something you know. The card is something you have. So in case you haven't guessed it, that's multi-factor, my dear friends. So there's many shapes and sizes of this in real life, but that's probably one of the most simple examples I can give you right now of multi-factor authentication. Now in the cloud or Azure or 365, which is where you guys are most likely going to be working, we already have usernames and passwords, email addresses and passwords, but that's not yet multi-factor. So should you go and enable multi-factor authentication in the cloud, it's normally going to involve having something extra like a phone. The phone would be something you have. So it's going to send you an OTP to something that you have, which is your phone. Or it might be that you're going to have to go and install a Microsoft app on your phone. And on this app, you're going to have to do some sort of confirmation. It's still on something that you have. Now, in case any of you guys are wondering what the something you are category is, that's generally something biometric. In other words, your fingerprint, uh, you get things that scans your eyes, you get voice recognition. I mean, hell, you even get facial recognition these days, which is pretty dope, I think, in my opinion. So, yeah, if you guys would like to go and use that, feel free to go and use it. Not all platforms support it, though. You will find that more and more devices these days have, for example, a fingerprint scanner. A lot of laptops do. A lot of these new phones have a fingerprint scanner. Uh, and a lot of companies, you know, at the gates or at the doors, you might find a fingerprint scanner. These are all forms of biometric locks. All right, so just to repeat... For something to classify as multi-factor, it has to fall into two different categories or more. So if I give you a pin or a password, that's something that falls into the same category. Yes, it's two authentications, but it's not two different forms of authentication. Um, so yeah, it has to fall into different categories. So with all of that being said, you're probably wondering, okay, so what is conditional access then? And where does this fit into the picture? Well, conditional access is basically when certain conditions need to be met for you or the user to be able to access a certain resource or a certain someone. Now, this is especially handy considering today's circumstances, I should say. You know, these days people are no longer working from the office. A lot of folks are working from home. 
everything is moving towards virtual, towards cloud, um, remote and all of that. So we're setting up a whole new set of problems effectively. Now, if someone's gonna be working from home, I don't just want any willy-nilly to be able to connect to any willy-nilly resource in the cloud. That's a security concern. So now I get to go and set up conditional access, which allows me to go and enforce certain rules and policies, so to speak. These are certain conditions that needs to be met before a person can go and access a certain resource. This could be something as simple as forcing you to use a company device. This could be a company laptop, perhaps. So if you're not using a company-owned device, a company laptop, which is perhaps joined to the company domain, it will not allow you access to this resource. That's a certain option you can go and choose. It could be where I can go and force you to use um, this resource from a certain location, perhaps. So if you're gonna try and access this resource from perhaps any location other than the office or other than your house, it's gonna flag it and it's gonna block you. So this is generally done via public IPs. I don't think we covered that in this particular course, but in case anyone is wondering, this is normally geographically blocked via public IP addresses. Now you can actually block people from accessing resources uh, in many, many ways. You can actually go and block a whole region from accessing a resource. I mean, you can go and block a whole country from accessing a certain resource. Or you can just go and set it up in such a manner that people just in general can't access this resource unless they specifically are in a specific location. In other words, in the office or at home. So if you're gonna go and try go to your local coffee shop or your local internet cafe and try and access this resource, it might not allow it. But if you're gonna try and access it from home or from the office, it's gonna see, okay, using that public IP address, you must be at home or using this public IP address, you must be at the office. So we can go and just block everything and only allow certain locations. Or we can just go and block whole regions, whole countries if we really want to. So if you know for a fact a certain country is absolutely not allowed to have access to this specific resource, you can go and block a whole darn country, obviously. It's not going to stop VPN access for those of you who knows what VPN is, but it is going to slow them down. It's going to make it very inconvenient. So I think with all of this being explained, let's jump into the portal and show you guys exactly where you can actually find these features. All right, so yes, this course is about MS700. Yes, it's mostly about Microsoft Teams. And yes, Microsoft Teams is mostly about Office 365. But unfortunately, there are certain settings and certain options that's not really available on the 365 side. You're gonna have to go to the Azure portal from time to time. So the moment you can see I'm on the normal 365 portal, uh, you could go to the admin portal of 365. So the way you would do that is on the normal portal, you would go click on the gray admin tile at the bottom left. And if you don't see this, it could be because you don't have the right privilege or you don't have the right license. So generally, assuming you've got the right privilege and the right license, you should be able to click on that little admin tile there. So that's going to bring up this admin center, the admin center. I'm saying it like that because there's actually many. If I were to go and expand this and scroll down, you would find here under admin centers, there's a bunch of other ones as well. And even that, my dear friends, is not all the admin centers we have. If you were to go click here where it says all admin centers, you notice there's a bunch more, quite a lot. So where do we actually configure multi-factor and conditional access? You're gonna have to do that on the Azure portal, like we said. So one way to get there is clicking here because we're gonna be doing it in the Azure Active Directory on Azure portal. Or alternatively, you can just go to HTTPS portal.azure.com. That's what I've done. So my next tab here, I went to HTTPS portal.azure.com, as you can see there in the top. The rest of the URL is obviously blocked out for obvious reasons in some cases. So how do I get to where I need to be? Top left hand side, you're gonna click on the little menu option. This is effectively gonna open the navigation pane as we know it in Azure. It's absolutely not gonna show you everything that's available on Microsoft's Azure portal. This is just some of the most common features that the average person would need. If you'd like to see more options, you're gonna to have to go here to where it says all services, create a resource, heck, you can even go here to where it says search. That's not the topic for today though. So the one we're looking for is obviously the one that says Azure Active Directory. I'm gonna click on that. All right, boys and girls, once you get to the Azure Active Directory, this is the blade for the Azure Active Directory. We call this menu a blade. It's not a navigation pane. The navigation pane is this one. So in this blade, which has got a whole bunch of tabs, you're gonna to have to scroll down until you get to security. So I'm gonna scroll, scroll, scroll. There we go, there's security. Because multi-factor authentication and conditional access is obviously security items. So it just logically makes sense that it's gonna be under security. Click on it. 
You'll see there's all kinds of useful documentation you can go read up about this. So if you'd like, you can go and read up here uh, about conditional access. You can go read up about multi-factor authentication. Microsoft's Azure portal is very cool in that sense. They will actually give you very detailed descriptions as to what exactly this is. Uh, I wouldn't say they're going to summarize the hell out of it. It might be a little bit too high grade for you. Uh, but still, nonetheless, it's free resources to go and use. So you don't need a license to actually be able to go and read that. So where is multi-factor authentication and conditional access? You're going to have to go click on the top tab here. It says conditional access. And in there is where you're going to be able to configure both multi-factor authentication and conditional access. Now, believe it or not, there's actually many ways you can go and configure multi-factor authentication for Azure. But the best way to go and do it is via the Azure portal, via the method I'm showing you right now. But there is, in fact, other ways to go and do this. So if I click on conditional access, you may or may not see some policies here in, if this is an existing environment. So I'm using basically a blank tenant today. So if you need to go and set up a new policy or if you want to go and look for multi-factor authentication or conditional access, we're going to go and click on the one that says new policy. All right, guys. So once you've clicked on new policy, this is effectively what you're going to be seeing in the beginning part. So here you'll find different categories. It might look a little bit confusing in the beginning, but it's actually pretty straightforward. So this policy that we want to assign, you know, this multi-factor authentication or conditional access, do we want to apply this to a specific user or users, a specific group or groups? And if so, you get to choose that here. You're most likely going to need to apply this to someone. I mean, otherwise, why are we creating this in the first place? So if I have to take a guess, it's probably going to be for people that's not in the office building. 10 to 1 people that's on the go a lot. You know, this could be a marketing person. It could be a manager that's got a lot of meetings off-site with a laptop, you know, that belongs to the company. So whoever these people might be, you get to choose them here or certain groups. So what you could possibly go and do is you can go create yourself a group and all of these people that's working off-premises, you can add them to that group and then here you just choose that specific group. If it's just one or two individuals, you could just go in and choose them obviously here. So if I click on that option here, you can see you can choose who are these people that you want this policy to apply to. Under cloud apps or actions, now if I click there, give it a second, you get to choose the apps where this policy is going to apply to. So I've chosen the users. So this could just be two people for argument's sake. So let's say it's two people. Now, regarding these two people that we've just selected or chosen, what exactly is going to trigger this policy, so to speak? It could be a certain application. So maybe when they go and open the Microsoft Teams app, you know, considering that this course is about Microsoft Teams, as soon as they open that app, that is what's going to trigger this policy. So when they open that app, what are the policies that's going to get triggered? It's going to go and check for certain things, perhaps. So if it sees you're opening the Microsoft Teams app and you're not on premises, you are off premises, it's going to require you to perhaps go and do multi-factor authentication, which is today's topic. So if it sees you're on premises, it might not be too concerned because you're obviously on premises. So it's not that big of a security deal. But if you're off premises, how do we know it is really you? How do we know someone didn't get your username and password and that they're not trying to log on as you? This is a real life risk that we're facing at this point in time. And you're never going to get rid of it. All we want to go and do is we want to go and put as many mitigations or solutions in this play uh, as possible to try and prevent this from happening. We just want to slow down this behavior and discourage this behavior. So now here you get to choose the app and for example, Microsoft Teams. And when I choose this app, I'm going to have to go and choose, okay, so what are these conditions after I've chosen the app? So I choose Microsoft Teams here. And if I go to conditions, you get to choose the conditions that needs to be met. So for example, device platform. If I were to go and choose device platform, I can force you to use only Microsoft devices. Now, I don't know why you'd want to go and do that. I personally don't like that. But if you decide to go and do that, you can force your people to only use Microsoft devices, not Android, not Apple, et cetera, et cetera. Or if you see that they are using Android, it stops them. If you see they're using Apple, it stops them. So you can either force them to use only certain devices or not to use certain devices. It's your choice, really. I mean, there's the locations one I was talking about earlier. So here, geographically speaking, you can go and block or allow people using their locations. And this is normally done via the public IP addresses. For those of you that's familiar with IP addresses, more specifically public IP addresses. So if you want, 
and you don't trust your people from working from unknown locations because you feel that that Wi-Fi they're using, that internet connection might be unsecure, you could force them to only be able to access resources of the company when they are on the company internet or when they are on their own internet at home. So if they're using any other internet connection other than the company internet or the internet specifically in their house, it will not allow them because it's going to see it's a different public IP. Or like I said earlier, you can just go and block everything for certain regions or certain countries. So if I don't trust a certain region or a certain country, that's just those are a little bit extreme examples of mine, but nonetheless, you can still go and do that. You can go block a whole region or a whole company if you really need to. Under access controls, let's look, have a look at this one. Sorry if I'm mumbling. All right, so under grant, this is actually where we get to configure the multi-factor authentication. So should someone be using Teams and should they be off-premises, what's going to actually kick in here? What do I require from them? What conditions need to be met here? So the conditions could be, for example, require multi-factor authentication. In other words, MFA, like we said earlier. So if I need someone to use MFA, this is where you're going to go and configure it. So you're going to first go to groups here, choose the person or the persons, choose the application which you require multi-factor authentication on, for example, Teams, choose your conditions. And then here I just simply go and tick the box that says require multi-factor authentication. You'll find there's actually a bunch of other cool ones you can also go and choose here. Require device to be marked as compliant. This is normally Intune compliant. I mean, check out Azura. Azura has got this nice, cool, funky feature that you can actually go and hover your mouse cursor over these little symbols. It'll give you a small description. For example, it says device must be Intune compliant. If the device is non-compliant, the user will be prompted to bring the device under compliance. This could be any kind of a compliance. You know, your company gets, gets to choose these compliancy requirements. It could be, for example, the device has to be a company device, not allowed to be your own device. It could be that the device has to be joined to the domain or Azure domain. It could be the device uh, has to have the latest updates of Windows, has to have an antivirus, has to have multi-factor authentication. It should not be rooted or jailbroken if it's Apple or Android. The list just goes on and on and on. But your company gets to choose the requirements when it comes to compliancy. Oh yeah, there's the Azure Active Directory one. Whoops, my bad. But yeah, you get the idea. And the sessions, those are just the sessions. Obviously, it speaks for itself. Um, so all of these things is actually called signals as well. So when people are going to be trying to connect, my thing is going to be looking for signals. That's what we call it. So these signals effectively are when you don't meet certain criteria. So if we see that this person is using Teams on a device off-premises, that is a signal that it's picking up. It's kind of like, okay, hey, there's a flag here, something's going on. That's called a signal. So it's going to be keeping its eye out for signals, any trace that someone is possibly in some sort of violation, and it's going to block them. So it's going to be keeping out an eye for signals for the most part. All right, guys, so I hope this has been informative. I hope this has helped you guys. Uh, please keep an eye out for episode five. This is episode four. I will be covering the full series of the Microsoft ME700, for those of you that don't know, and I will also be covering other Microsoft series not to mention courses from other vendors for that part. So if you are new to this channel, please give the video a like. Please consider subscribing. I'll see you guys in episode 5. Bye, guys.